Good morning, everyone. Today I'll be talking about running an API gateway on Istio, our pitfalls and learnings. My name is Kareem Lakhani. I'm a senior staff software engineer at Intuit, and I'm the technical lead of Intuit's API gateway. So our agenda today is talking about Intuit API gateway, why in-house, why we migrated to cloud native technologies, um, our architecture, and the pitfalls and learnings that everyone's here for. So at Intuit, we're leading the way in building an AI native development experience using cloud native open source technologies. And this is some statistics on our scale. I'll call out uh, $560 billion of money moved. And some more stats on this, on our developer environment that's built on cloud native technologies. We're running at peak over 1 million cores, CPU cores, 2,000 services, all of which have multiple APIs, one or more APIs, over 16,000 namespaces, and over 1,000 teams. And the API gateway is the front door to all this infrastructure. So the Intuit API gateway at a glance what is the role of it? So as I mentioned, it's the front door to all the requests coming in. And it also serves for a lot of service-to-service -service communication. Um, before, recently in the last few years, we've adopted Istio Service Mesh, but before that, there was a need for service-to-service -service communication, and we actually used our API gateway for that as well. So it provides routing, security, authentication and authorization of both the client application as well as the user, metrics, and dashboards, including our golden signals, which provides availability latency metrics for every service on API Gateway, very detailed access logging, and quality of service features, including rate limiting and traffic dialing. So the benefits and stats of our API Gateway it's highly scalable. We run over 30 billion requests per day at peak and over 1 million requests per second. And we scale up to about 6,000 pods across all of our environments at peak. It's highly available. Um, there's no room for downtime really, so we have four nines of availability at the minute level. It's highly reliable. As I mentioned, it's the source of the golden signal metric, so it can't be wrong. Um, when it says that a service has a certain error rate or certain latency, it has to be trusted. It has to be a low latency. So we look at targeting um, 30 milliseconds at the P99 for our overhead. And it has very deep self-service management uh, through our developer portal. Uh, the onboarding experience as well as the configuration management experience is all integrated into there. So why in-house development? Uh, our API gateway started about 11 years ago and when we were still in the Intuit data center. At that time, we had a need to move towards microservices from our monolithic architecture. And so at that time, there were not too many open source options. The ones that were available were not uh, highly performant as we needed. And so we felt that we could build our own and um, we saw a value in being able to customize it to fit our needs. So we built our own API gateway. And then over the last 11 years, we've made a lot of customizations as we anticipated, including uh, deep integration with our identity providers. Uh, we do a ticket exchange and as well as a lot of features to support different business use cases, such as fraud detection and traffic capture so our approach is very similar to Netflix Zool 2 and AWS API Gateway. We use a non-blocking and asynchronous architecture, which uh, is written in Java. And one of the differences is that it has partitioning built in as a first class feature. So our partitioning is really key. In the control plane, we have partitioning logically in the data. And then in the data plane, we have partitioning in the compute and the network. So that way we're able to isolate workloads such as QuickBooks, TurboTax, MailChimp, Credit Karma into their dedicated infrastructure and keep all the data separate as well as the compute. And then compared to AWS API Gateway, we have more relaxed quotas. 
So we allow longer timeouts uh, and larger request and response payloads. So as I mentioned, we started in the data center and then we did a lift and shift into AWS cloud. And then after a few years, we started considering should we move to cloud native technologies? And so I'll talk about why we decided to do that. The first step, the first reason is Istio. So we wanted integration with the service mesh, right? The service mesh came about three years ago and our API gateway was standing alone from that. It wasn't really connected to it. And this put an extra burden on the service developers to support traffic coming in from gateway and from the mesh, as well as us implementing special mechanisms to establish trust between our gateway and the mesh. So we wanted to have a deep connection between those technologies and that would improve our security, reliability and observability. It would also reduce our data transfer costs because we are relying on public internet to move these bytes and with Istio we can go uh, through a private networking. Additionally, we are looking to enable network abstraction, which is our way for the client developer that regardless of whether they're calling an API gateway endpoint or a mesh endpoint, it's the same experience. So before this, you would call a gateway endpoint using a .com, using a certain authentication protocol, and with mesh, you would use a different one. So we wanted to unify that experience. Next, we wanted to improve our observability. Now we had metrics, we had logging, however, there were gaps in it and um, we were using some legacy technologies which were causing quite a lot of overhead uh, development wise and deployment wise. Um, so we saw an opportunity to improve that with Prometheus and other cloud native technologies. Additionally, we had uh, our cost analytics were rather complicated. It was built all custom, the, the chargeback model that we have and how we report on that. So we saw an opportunity there with better isolation of workloads uh, with Kubernetes clusters, with namespaces to get clarity on that. And then finally, we wanted to take advantage of Intuit's modern SaaS platform, which in the last few years we've been um, building on. So, you know, we want to take advantage of these cloud native technologies such as Argo CD, Argo rollouts, Argo workflows, and Istio service mesh, which is built on Istio, Intuit service mesh, which is built on Istio and Admiral. Um, so we were seeing issues, you know, with our custom scripts, our custom deployment. It was hard for new team members to join and get onboarded. We saw an opportunity there to improve so that we could be on the same technology stack as other services at Intuit. And at Intuit, we believe deeply in open source and open collaboration. So we're the recipient of the end user award in 2019 and 2022. And we also have various open source projects that we've created and we maintain, including NumaFlow, Admiral, uh, Argo, and we're the end user of multiple open source and cloud native technologies, including Kubernetes, Istio, and Envoy. So there's a link here for our open source community if you'd like to join. So quickly, I'll go through our API gateway architecture before I get into the pitfalls and learnings on our journey to migrate. So it all starts with our mobile applications, our web apps, our users, and they make requests to various APIs. As I mentioned, there's 2,000 plus different APIs at Intuit, not all user facing, but um, that all comes through our API gateway. And so our API gateway will have multiple APIs that it's serving. It's uh, in Kubernetes and Istio enabled. Now we use Admiral, which is our open source multi-cluster service mesh solution to inject all the configuration for all the different clusters at Intuit so that API Gateway knows how to route the request to the right cluster and to the right service. So from there, we're able to route the request to the API that was so it's supposed to be meant for. And then from there, the services can talk to each other through the service mesh. So that's a high level view of our architecture. And as I mentioned, Admiral provides the automatic configuration and service discovery because we have a multi-cluster architecture. And a little bit deeper look at that. So in our control plane, which is Istio based, we have Istio D, which has the Envoy config and Kubernetes config. We use Argo for our rollouts. 
And then we have Admiral, which is pushing all this multi-cluster config into Istio. And we also have a CertMan component, which is responsible for the certificate management. And then in our data plane, we were a SEP request both from a public load balancer and an Istio ingress gateway. And the requests come into our API gateway through our Envoy proxy. Um, we have an MTLS agent, which is managing the MTLS certs. And then we are able to use MTLS to call out to our backend services very securely and through using private networking. Um, and that way, we're able to have a, a very secure and reliable communication. So now moving on to our pitfalls and learnings, I'll list them out here and go into more detail. So I'll be talking about Istio sidecar in hybrid mode, graceful shutdown, configuration overload, outlier detection, and auto scaling and resources. So starting with Istio in sidecar mode. So in most Istio deployments, traffic comes into the cluster through the ingress gateway, which does a TLS termination and then an MTLS is established between the Istio ingress gateway and the, the Istio proxy itself. Now our API gateway supported an ALB ingress as well, and we wanted to continue supporting an ALB ingress for our, that's where all our certificates were installed. So we wanted, we didn't want two different envoys, we wanted one envoy that can do both MTLS with the Istio ingress gateway and TLS with the ALB, and that wasn't supported so we worked with the Istio team to uh, make an open contribution to the Sidecar API with a new property TLS. That allows us to support both TLS termination on the Istio proxy as well as MTLS all on one port. So for more details, I have here listed this Istio RFC which goes into the configuration, but it's just a few configurations needed to set that up. Next, we have graceful shutdown. Now, this is not exactly purely an Istio problem, but we faced a more complication with Istio. So as we started rolling out our API gateway with uh, Kubernetes, uh, as we were scaling down, we saw errors sometimes, and we found out, okay, there's a lot of different settings that have to be set up exactly correctly to have a graceful shutdown. So in our case, we had an idle timeout on our load balancer, we had a pre-stop on the container, which could sleep. Uh, we had a termination grace period on the Istio proxy. We had a termination grace period on the container. And we had a target group deregistration delay. So we had to do a deep dive and uh, understand what all these configurations do, how to configure them correctly. And uh, this is what we ended up settling on. We have a max timeout on our gateway of about five minutes on most of our workloads. On some of our workloads, we do allow longer timeouts. But this is what we ended up settling on. So this way, the request stop coming to gateway when a, when a pod is being deregistered. And we give enough time for requests, in-flight requests to finish before we start terminating the, the workload like the pod and the containers. Next one is configuration overload. So as I mentioned, we have a lot of services at Intuit. API Gateway has a lot of clusters. And we have partitioning built in to our data plane, but not in the Istio, in the Istio world. So without partitioning in the Istio world, all the configurations are delivered to every single gateway. But every single gateway doesn't exactly talk to every single service. So this was an area of uh, improvement for us. We were getting a lot of data transfer from Istio D to Istio proxy. It was going cross AZ. And even during a scale up, we saw a CPU spike because of this. So to uh, resolve this, we started implementing a partitioning logic into our Admiral. So that way, the API gateway only gets the config that it needs to. So our Admiral knows about the partitioning of the data in our control plane and our registry, and it's able to use that to make sure that a gateway doesn't load all the config for every service in the mesh. Next, we have outlier detection. So in Istio, there's a nice feature called outlier detection, which is a circuit breaker, which tracks the status of every host and how that host is doing so that if it becomes unhealthy, you can stop talking to it. 
However, in our gateway, we are talking to 500 different services on one pod. So every, every service that we talk to might only get a few requests. And so it's hard to set a certain number of failures that will trigger this circuit breaker. And so what happens is a certain host on the back end might be unhealthy, but we don't know about it. We continue sending it requests. Now, this is something that we still need to work on, so it's a work in progress, um, but we need to extend this and optimize it to work with this workload. Um, we're exploring active health checking or some type of uh, global circuit breaker type of implementation because, uh, you know, obviously when a backend is unhealthy, we want to stop talking to it. Next, auto scaling and resource limits. Again, this is a common problem with Kubernetes, and we uh, face more issues with Istio proxy here. So first of all, our gateway has to be rapidly scaling to handle surges of traffic, load tests. We can't really control the traffic coming in. So our HPA has to be very optimized. And um, we originally went with our HPA implementation, but saw that it was either over, over scaling or um, oscillating and scaling. And we also saw challenges with the, we were using the average CPU of the containers on the pod. And that wasn't really a great metric to scale on because Istio CPU was fairly low while our application CPU was fairly high. And so the average wasn't there to trigger the scaling. So we were basically scaling on the average, which was the default in our workload. So the solution is to understand the metrics, understand which metrics you want to scale on, whether it's the application CPU, the pods, average CPU, Istio CPU on your workload. And in our case, we use now multiple metrics. So we use both the average and the pod level CPU. And another thing is we, we weren't happy with the HPA implementation for our workload. So we actually have a extension of that called uh, step scaling, which basically generates a synthetic metric based on how much we're above the target CPU. So if we're, for example, here I have, you know, if we're more than nine to 13% above the target CPU, then we actually scale up our, what we say is our CPU by 25% higher or 50% higher. So that way we're scaling more aggressively, but not too aggressively based on how much we're actually over the target. So with this implementation, we had a lot more control over our scaling and we're able to scale just as much as we need and not have it scale up and down. Now, the last thing is our CPU throttling. So we deployed this API gateway with Istio, Kubernetes, production, serving all these requests. Overall, everything was going good, except for two of our clusters had a problem. <clears throat> and things were basically slowing down. Latency was being added. We weren't sure what's going on. And then we found out it's because of CPU throttling. <clears throat> so we didn't have that visibility, so we had to get that uh, add, added to our dashboards and understand you know, why is CPU throttling happening, why our requests or our limits not set for this workload uh, correctly, and um, we had to test different setups to see what's the best setup, and we're still kind of going through that process right now. So, and part of this, again, is with how do you set the limit on Istio proxy, right? That's another, it's uh, challenging enough, and now you have another container, and um, so far we haven't seen CPU throttling on the Istio, but it's something that we're keeping an eye on. And in some workloads, we did see higher workload on Istio proxy, so we did have to increase the requests and the limits on that specific cluster. So an overview is uh, of the pitfalls and learnings on our Istio cloud native journey is the hybrid mode, graceful deregistration, configuration overload, outlier detection, requests and limits correctly, and our auto scaling. And with that, I will uh, open it up for questions. Um, please follow our uh, open source community. We have a booth, which we have uh, swag. And uh, as well, on the right-hand side, I have um, a QR code for a feedback on this uh, presentation. And also a link here to our open source admiral for more details on our multi-cluster service mesh solution.
So any questions? <laughs> Yes. Yes, I'll repeat the question. So the questions are on our certificate management and are for MTLS certs, like how do we do that? So we do have an in-house uh, cer uh, certificate provider, and we also have an in-house uh, agent, like a container that, that communicates with it as well. It's turned off. <laughs> Hello, test. Yeah, I think it was working. We are using, I believe it's IP mode, or it's. Is it IP mode? Yeah, it's IP mode. Okay. Was yeah. That that was always like that. Okay. All right. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, so, um, from transitioning your in-house uh, API gateway to Istio API gateway, uh, how is that journey looks like? What are the things that you kind of like, you know, uh, uh, looked into, and what are the kind of different uh, sort of tools that you might have used to figure out that things are safe to kind of like transition to this new one? I'm sorry, I didn't hear the whole question. Uh, so, can you hear me now? Yeah, yeah I can hear you. So, me. from the um, in-house the API gateway to the new Istio-based API gateway, what, how was that transition? Like, what was your experience in terms of like moving to the Istio one? What are the different things that, if you elaborate on that, like you know, um, the new gateway is in production, and you are safe and confident enough with this? Uh, yeah, yeah. So, I, I mean, just to clarify, right? We're using we moved our gateway to Kubernetes and we're using Istio in collaboration with it. So overall, our journey was fairly smooth aside from these you know, issues that we faced. We did a slow rollout across all of our workloads, across pre-prod, it was a multi-month migration. And um, you know, I think pretty much now we're at a place where we have a much better security with our backend services. We're able to use TLS rather than a custom JOT authorization or trust that we built earlier. Um, and now one of the great benefits is we have the Istio metrics and logging on the destination. So a lot of times the destination services would come to the gateway and say, hey, my service is not working. Is it because of the gateway? And we wouldn't really have much insight on what's going on on their end. They would have to kind of show us. And then we would say, well, look, your service is unhealthy. So now with the Istio metrics, we're able to have a uniform way to understand what's going on on the service and troubleshoot those issues. Um, in one of your slides, you talked about outlier detection on, on one of your slides. Yeah. And you talk about circuit breaker patterns and things like that. Can you go a little bit into how you're achieving like um, multi-tenancy and isolation and uh, yeah. for the different services? Definitely, yeah. So the question is around how do we achieve multi-tenancy and isolation? So we have isolation at the cluster level as well as the namespace level. So we, as I mentioned, we have multiple clusters, multiple namespaces. Now within a namespace, we do serve traffic for multiple services up to maybe five, 600 services in some cases. In some cases, only five services, depending on the workload. So there is some risk for a noisy neighbor there. Um, but you know we do have that level of isolation, and we basically have thread pools and connection pools set up to help isolate some of the traffic there. However, you know we have seen issues where if one service is unhealthy, it can kind of spike the CPU and cause an impact on other service. So that's also something that we're continually working on improving. Thanks for the question. And with that, I'm out of time. So thank you, everyone.